for making the trek, everybody. Yeah. This crazy downpour. Is it still raining? Is it still raining? I don't know. Oh, I, I assume it's, it's still raining. Yeah. Well, I am I'm fortunate to introduce our speaker for this session, uh, Beans, Kids, and Farmers. Uh, Kelly Attenberry, Atterbury is a WSU horticulture graduate student, and she's here to share her research on working with kids on growing beans and eating beans and all of those things. Um, she said if you have some questions that will not take too long to answer, you can go ahead and ask them as things go on. At the end, there'll be time for more questions. And I have some handouts that I'll give you when she's finished. And I will also come around and give out the evaluation forms while she's talking. So help me welcome Kelly. All right, thank you, Linda. And thank you, everybody, for coming to this session. <clears throat> There's lots of interesting things going on. But it is interesting to see the life of a graduate student because it's a rigorous program and wonderful WSU horticulture scientists are shaping us young people to teach, teach people and students how to grow food and staple crops at that. And it's just a very interesting perspective that I have coming into the arena of growing plants. So I appreciate your time and I'm really excited to share my project with you. So the title of my research is Increasing Knowledge, Preference, and Availability of Pulses in K-12 Schools. And that is a mouthful. That is the title of my thesis. Could you say it again? It's right here on the screen. Oh. Increasing Knowledge, Preference, and Availability of Pulses in K-12. <clears throat> Does anyone know what pulses are? Yes. I'm just making sure we have a general understanding. I'll go into it a little bit more, but yes, pulses are dry beans, include dry beans. So I'm a graduate student with Dr. Carol Miles at the WSU Mount Vernon Research and Extension Center. I'm in the Department of Horticulture, and I'm going into my second year of my master's. <clears throat> I got my Bachelor's of Science at Bastyr University, and I studied herbal science. So I have a strong passion for herbal medicine as well. And this program that I'm in now is just helping me to form herb gardens and herb farms and apothecaries and make herbal medicine available to people and to teach kids about herbs. So this really is very relevant in my life. So just to start out with my overall project goals. The number one goal I have is to identify dry bean varieties that are well suited to growing here in Western Washington. And in that, so that's called the variety trial. And I'm comparing Northwest Washington heirloom dry beans to standard dry bean varieties that are grown outside of our region, but are in the same respective market class. My second goal with my research here is to implement K-12 pulse education. I'm doing this by creating <clears throat> school garden-based curriculum. And our goal is to promote healthy eating behavior with K-12 students by increasing dry bean consumption. <clears throat> and then we are evaluating the impact of this education because it's research. We have to evaluate something. So legumes, just a brief overview. This is a picture of the Rockwell bean. These are the flowers of the Rockwell plant. So legumes are in the Fabaceae family, and they have very typical zygomorphic flowers, which commonly are described as the banner, wing, and keel of a boat. There are flowers there, as you can see. Legumes have pods that contain seeds, and legumes, bless their hearts, fix atmospheric nitrogen. We love that about beans. Legumes categorized by use here. As you can see on the right hand side, pulses include dry beans, lentils, chickpeas, and dry beans. Dry peas, excuse me. Dry beans are a pulse, and dry beans are a dry grain legume. That is how they're categorized. Dry beans have pods that dry naturally in the field, 
They are used for human and animal food. They are not used for oil extraction, and they are not considered a fresh vegetable because they are a dry seed. So my research for the variety trial began here in Mount Vernon, which we all probably know, a little bit south of Bellingham. And the driving growing season is summer, so it likes a hot climate. And our climate here is semi-cool and maritime, but it turns out you can actually grow beans here. Our average summer temperature is 73 degrees Fahrenheit, and our average summer rainfall is 0.9 inches. So we grow beans in the summer. Dry bean agriculture. Dry beans are categorized by market class, and as you can see here, there are just a handful of states that grow a majority of dry beans in the United States, but what's unique is that Washington State grows a wide variety of beans. Washington grows 1.5% of the nation's beans, which equates to 23,000 acres. And you'll see in the USDA database, that number is higher, but that is because they include garbanzo beans. And I'm not looking at garbanzos. So this is a picture of the navy beans, which used to be the number one selling market class in the United States because they were given to the US Navy and that's how they got their name. Just like in that can, that's an old advertisement. These are all of the market classes of dry beans. So currently, the number one selling market class are the Pintos, and the second is Navy Bean now, and tying for third is Great Northerns and Black Beans. So who knows what Pinto beans make? Refried beans. Refried beans, yes. And then what about, how do you think we get our black beans in most often here in the United States? Chili? Chili, yes, that's one answer, and also bean burritos. That's how students most often associate themselves with beans, is the Taco Bell bean burrito. Okay? So yeah, Pinto, Small White Navy, Black, and Great Northern. Those are the top four in the United States. This is a picture of the... I apologize about the... I think it's if you hold it... If I just hold it right in my mouth, maybe? No, I think you need to hold it away. Hold it away. Can you hear me if I do this? Yeah. Okay. Do I even need this? I don't think so. I'll just hold it down here. Yeah, just a little bit away. And again, if you guys have any questions as I'm going through this, it's, I always remember things when people bring up questions and, and you learn better when you have a dialogue. So if you have questions, do feel free to ask. Here's a picture of all of my uh, market classes. Kelly, excuse me, sorry. Yep. So maybe it's connecting, you're too close to that speaker. Oh. So if you just okay. shimmy and print it. I mean, let's just. Set okay. It Try that. Okay. So this is a picture of all of the market classes that I have growing in my variety trials. Look how beautiful those are. They are beautiful. Gorgeous. <clears throat> Aren't they just pretty? And the unique thing about this is actually these are all the heirlooms. The Northwest Washington heirlooms that I'm growing. And this is a table that shows the county of origin of those heirlooms. I'm collaborating with Brooke Brower. He's a PhD student in Dr. Stephen Jones's programs. He connected with local Northwest Washington growers to connect them with their seed, asked to use it in our trials, and He's doing another project where we're actually looking at the sociology of why beans are so important to people. Because if you grow beans, you love your beans. <laughs> and I am so glad I'm doing this research because now I love beans. Awesome. And here's actually a um, showcase of the beans that I'm growing. If you want to pass these around, I'd be happy to do that. And you can just look at them. They're labeled and in vials. So we'll just pass that around as we go. <clears throat> So as you can see, the heirlooms on the left here, and then the column that says standard variety, that's the variety that I paired with so that I can compare the, for my research. And then just to classify what I mean when I say heirloom, and here's a picture of Rockwell. Rockwell is an heirloom from Whidbey Island. 
Willowwood Farm has been growing this bean since 1880. And it is, as you can see, it is an heirloom. It has been passed down at least two generations and it's at least 50 years old. Then you have here the orca. Has anyone ever heard of orca? Yeah? So this is a cultivar. This has been bred by combining two different plants together. They're not genetically modified, they're just traditionally bred. So that's a, called a cultivar. We're just getting some terminology. Yes, Andy? When you say passed on two generations, mm -hmm. is that uh, human lineage or is that? That's human lineage, yes. Generation? Thank you. He asked, he asked if the generations I'm talking about with heirlooms is human generations, and it is. So the USDA has actually defined heirloom, and it's passed down at least two generations of humans. And then we have an interesting overlap here. So we have niche market varieties, which is why we're looking at the heirlooms in the first place, is because Rockwell can sell their niche market heirloom for a premium price, upwards of $10 a pound, rather than $1.69 or whatever. But Orca has become a niche market because of its story, and that it's named after the Puget Sound. Rockwell is an, a niche market because of its story and that it's an heirloom. So just getting some interesting marketing terminology out there and just classifying these beans. They're very diverse. There's, there's more classification, but I thought this was an interesting thing to just make known. So we have some local dry bean growers in our area, of course, even though it's generally thought that we don't grow dry beans west of the mountains. The majority of our beans are grown east of the mountains. They have really nice um, summer weather and then they get their irrigation from the Columbia River. But it turns out we can grow beans here if we have varieties that we can plant early and harvest early. Because, of, because we do have 73 degree average weather in the summer, we have the temperature and we have the natural irrigation. <clears throat> and here is Frog Song Farm at the Anacortes Farmer's Market selling their premium market dry beans for $10 a pound. Yep. And there's Willowwood Farm where they grow the Rockwell and then that's Crystal Rome. I'm sure you Whatcom folks know her. She's with Backyard Beans and Grains. She's been working with me on this project. So it's been fun to get to know those farmers. And then, of course, we love beans because they're so darn healthy. I love that. And we have some major diet-related health issues in the United States, which is another reason why I'm doing this research. So, our students, they're eating less than 10% of the recommended daily amounts of their fruits and vegetables. That's a really low number. And combined with lack of exercise, the lack of eating vegetables is, is causing diseases. So heart disease, did you know that it is the number one cause of death in the United States? Yes. Heart disease, which is a diet related disease. And then we have obesity. It's more than doubled in children. Wait, in the last 30 years, it's more than doubled in children and quadrupled in adolescents. It's a real concern. And then we have type two diabetes, which now affects 151,000 young adults. And that's the latest CDC or Control for Disease Center, Center for Disease Control data. So these are very real issues that we have. These are all diet related issues. And that's why we have what I like to call the legume legislation, where the national dietary guidelines have recognized the healthy attributes of beans. So they've recommended that Americans eat one and a half cups of pulses per week. That number could definitely increase. But that means one and a half cups of what? Dry beans, chickpeas, dry peas, and lentils. So that's the recommendation there. Yes? Is that cooked or uncooked? That is cooked. Thank you. Yes. And then the schools, they are also requiring pulses be served in the cafeterias now. The USDA's National School Lunch Program requires one half of a cup of pulses per week per student to be served. And the USDA, the USDA commodity offers beans, so that's good. So the first goal with my variety trial 
is to compare dry bean varieties, and we're comparing these to see which ones have the highest yield and the shortest days to harvest, because those are what we those are what we want. And we also are evaluating food properties because when farmers come to the market, their customers ask them two things. How much protein do these have and how long will it take to cook? So we looked at those things. This was a two-year study. It started last summer and we just finished this year's harvest and threshing. <clears throat> we did this at WSU Mount Vernon. We are on a certified organic land and we used small scale production practices. I had 17 heirloom dry bean varieties in this trial and I compared that to make a, I compared those to the standard varieties for a total of 37 different varieties in this trial. Last year it was a smaller number, this year it has increased. So those are the current numbers. And I don't need to show you that again. So here's an uh, aerial view of my dry bean variety trial in 2013, and you can just plainly see the, the variation. It might be hard to see, but there's yellowing, meaning some of the bean varieties are maturing earlier. There's some empty plots, meaning that dry bean didn't even germinate. And there's different heights going on, so there's, there's variation with, within these dry beans. Were they all planted at the same time? Yes, they were all planted at the same time. Okay, so, and here's planting actually. So, I planted two, I did in 2013 plant in two different dates, but this year I was able to plant on May 15th, which, which is the recommended planting day, which is rare that you actually, Mother Nature lets you do the recommendations. So that was cool. And I used a randomized complete block design. My plots were four rows wide and 10 feet long. Spacing in the row was two inches. Spacing between the row was 34 inches, and for each variety, I did four replications. So that's the research end of it. And I know some master gardeners do some research at home, so I hope this is of interest. I know I'm gonna take this knowledge and do my own variety jobs at home. And we didn't irrigate. So we followed the common practices of driving farmers in our region. We didn't have to irrigate, and that is huge. And here we are, the crew, we hand planted. So before I planted, I inoculated these beans with a granular rhizobium blend. I just put them in the little seed packets and shook them up dry. We fertilized in 2013 on June 13th and in 2014 on the 6th of June, we used a program, we used organic fertilizer called Proganic A24. Last year we did 46 pounds of nitrogen. This year we did the recommended 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And we used a tractor to side dress. So weed control. That is one thing we really wanted to work on reducing because hand weeding can take a darn long time. So we did our typical alleyway cultivation with the tractor, as you see here as two heads going down either side of the bean row. But in order to reduce the hand weeding, we did something called hilling. So we just pushed the soil up to the base of the bean, and that reduced our weeds substantially. We did one round of hand weeding, and it really wasn't even that bad. We, because we did the hilling when the beans were tall and the weeds were small. So it, it was cool. I'm sure we'll continue the weed control research because that's if we want beans to grow here, we're going to have to figure that one out really well. <clears throat> so we did data collection. And a rem as a reminder, the plots were four rows wide and ten feet long. And for each different um, type of data I collected, I measured in the center two feet of the center two rows of those four rows. So emergence, we counted emergence to see which ones had the earliest emergence, which ones didn't emerge. And we've learned that the huterites and the yellows, so the huterites are yellow market classes, yellows and white kidney beans, they have um, an emergence that's slower if you plant them when the soil is colder. So they like a, a warmer soil. We planted these when the temps of the soil was, was about 55 degrees. We measured plant height, as you can see in this picture. 
This was the first year when I was really excited to do everything. <laughs> Inferring that that changed. <laughs> just kind of. It's tedious. Yeah. It's tedious work. Research is tedious. It takes patience. We also did flowering data. We measured the first flower when one plant had one flower. We measured 50% flowering when 50% of the plants had one flower, and then 100% is when 100% when, when of the plants had one flower at least. <clears throat> There's the eclipse black bean at 100% flower and has those beautiful purple flowers. And then data collection for yield began with harvesting. In 2013, we harvested from September 1st to the 2nd of October. And this year, we started earlier and ended earlier. We had a nice dry summer. We harvest when the pods lose pigmentation and begin to be papery, not fleshy, and when the seeds develop their typical varietal color. And again, the center five feet of the center two rows is what I harvested from. We took out the entire plant, including the roots, last year, but this year we decided to just cut the base and leave those healthy roots in the soil where the nodules are, and I thought that made more sense. We harvested by hand. I also, if you have a small plot, that's, that's doable, but for projection commercially, you're gonna wanna figure out how to combine them. And then we dried them for 36 hours in a heater. So that's 105 degrees Fahrenheit. We had very ideal equipment for drying our dry beans. I know one of the struggles for local farmers is drying their beans. Even though they're partially dry in the field, you do wanna get them a little crisper. So if you have a dehydrator, that's great. If you have a greenhouse, just turn them. It's a lot of work. The harvest and um, cleaning is probably the most work. And 105 is the ideal temperature? Yes, is 105 the ideal temperature? I would recommend just not going a one, over 110 because you don't want to kill the germ. So yeah, 105 is nice if you can get it that. Yeah, oh, she was first, sorry. Oh, I was just curious. You're drying them in the pod, right? Yes, we're drying the entire plant. Oh, the whole plant? The whole plant. And I know that they're oh. completely dry when the stem snaps. Yeah, yeah. What was your question? Um, when you say you had an ideal setup for drying, what was that? I mean, I, we have a big dryer. Okay. And most of the time, farmers don't have those. So I just wanted to put it out there that that is something to think about if you're going to grow beans. But another option is, once you get them threshed, you could have a smaller de dehydrator and just put the seeds in there and, and just get all that last bit of moisture because these are ideal storage proteins. So if you want to put them in glass jars, you want to make sure there's, they're not going to mold. Okay. See what the pinto beans look like? Raise your hand if you've grown beans before. You're enthusiastic, I like it. I'm a big bean person. That's so cool. Thank you for coming. Okay, so a portion you have. So that's what they look like. And I apologize, it's hard to see. Then we were threshing our beans. There's Chris and Rome again. So we used this converted chipper that Dr. Carol Miles built. And I put the website on here if you wanted to look on how to build yourself a small scale thresher. And I'm going to be giving you a handout at the end of the lecture that Dr. Miles and I wrote on home gardening. So the link is on that oh, handout. Yeah, we just we feed the whole plant into this thresher. And out comes the debris. And we just then take out the big debris, put it in the compost, and we put the beans and debris that are left in the winter and separated by the fan. So as you can see here, just make sure you see it. The beans go down this ramp. Here's the fan. They fall down, the debris flies, and they drop into a bucket. It's, this is the best part of bean growing. All these beautiful colors, it's just so much fun. Okay, so then we have 2013 results. I only included on this graph the beans that I was comparing because some of the beans didn't have a standard variety to compare to or a Northwest Washington heirloom to compare to. So what we have on the board here is, well overall, 
we have a 2,424 kilograms per hectare, which is, in, if you wanted to translate that into pounds per acre, which is what most normal farmers would want to look at, it's just this number, just take it down just like a couple hundred. The next slide will be more clear on what pounds per acre looks like. But I wanted to just show you, this is, oh, this is the overall mean for yield, which is average nationwide. So that's the number one good sign. We got an average yield that was substantial. As you can see, the heirlooms actually had a slightly higher yield. And then, oh, yes. <laughs> but the standards really were not far behind. So the Eclipse Black Bean was the highest. But as you'll see, it actually had a really late maturity. So those are the two things you want to look at. And I have them grouped by market class. Here's one set of blacks. Here's another set of blacks. Here's the browns. Then our cranberries. The red is heirloom. The gray is standard. Hewnerites, which are yellows. And then Ireland Creek Annies are also yellow. So just keep that in mind. And then the second graph I have here is the days to maturity. And the lower the day, the better. Our average was 112 days to maturity. So the heirlooms, they averaged at 109 days, which we are, if you wanted a perfect days to maturity in Western Washington, it would be 104. That's early September. But the standards weren't far behind. Okay, so keep that in mind. Here's, let's summarize what that was. So our averages, Here's heirlooms, here's standards in pounds per acre, that's why the numbers are different. Really not a whole lot different. Highest yielding were three standards, but following really closely behind was heirlooms. So, but then over here for the days to maturity, the heirlooms were the, in the top running. So, what do, I, what do I do with this information? I have to make some, some recommendations and analyze this year's data to really extrapolate further on this, but this is what you should take home. Dry bean growers in Northwest Washington would benefit varieties that have the shortest days to harvest. So know your variety. Get short days to harvest. Plant as early as possible. We had some farmers in La Conner planting early June, which I was just right down the road from them, and theirs didn't mature as fast as mine, which was just 15 days earlier in the ground. So I'd recommend just getting your beans in as early as possible, yeah. And is that based on the soil temperature? <clears throat> I mean, you're Did, looking at your backyard, you're growing your backyard, you take your soil thermometer out there and you say, okay, I'm waiting for 55, is that how that you That works, work? that works. Okay, but and regardless of how wet it is? You don't want to suffocate your beans, if you can, if you can, get some, they like sandy, they like to be able to be drained. So try to choose a non-soppy wet area. Because that's another issue, farmers in the San Juan Islands, they're just waiting and waiting for their ground to dry, and it just doesn't happen until August. So maybe find a different land, I don't know. You, you can't do it in cold, cold Ra wet. Race beds, double dig. Oh, thank you, Andy, race beds, double dig. The yeah, here commercially, but for the gardener. Correct, yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm always learning too, so don't hesitate to give, give your um, expert opinion. Yes, sir. It always helps if you can see that there's a nice sunny streak coming up mm -hmm. after you plant them. Yeah, good uh, idea. Yeah, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep, looking at the weather. That's always something you should do. And then, so based on these results, growers should look to Northwest Washington heirlooms if you're looking for that premium price, if you're looking for that story, <clears throat> and if not, you should just select for very early maturing varieties. Just be sure to select. Yeah? I want to be clear on the, the reason for that. Is that just because um, they will beat the rains coming in? More, yes, more thank you. To... Yes, so, yes. If you don't get your beans out of the ground, before late September, early October here in Northwest Washington in general, you will risk 
molding and not being able to harvest a dry plant. So you want to get the beans out of the ground before the rains come. Yep. Okay. And then we also took these beans and we did the cooking time measurements. This is a Matson bean cooker. This is what bean breeders use. It doesn't, oops, it doesn't give you what, let's say a pressure cooker would give you in terms of time. It gives you a relative cooking time. So you soak the beans and you place them under these pins and then it goes directly into your hot water boiling bath and these pins penetrate the bean when it's done. It's still a little bit hard, it's relative cooking time. So bean breeders can look at a vast array of different varieties and get relative cooking times. So the time it took for 80% of these pins to drop is when we knew they're done. We did three replications of each of the entries and we did this eight months after harvest. And then we took the beans and we measured their firmness. So this is a penetrometer and it just measures the gram of force directly after the cooking. We put them in the freezer for three minutes to stop cooking and then we use the firmness tester and that pin penetrates the bean. But then we had to look at pressure cooking time because it wasn't giving the people the answers they wanted. So here we are measuring the actual cooking time. I just used your typical um, pressure cooker. I actually cooked all of the beans for 10 minutes each and then I did the firmness. So I was able to, at first we had a lot of time trying to figure out the protocol for this one. But we just decided we'll do a strict 10 minutes on each variety and then measure the firmness and that'll give us a relative cooking time to see which one was fastest. So here's the results on that. This is preliminary results and it's a lot of small words here. But just like in the other graphs, I have them cup full. See there's a space here, space here, space here. Um, those spaces separate the market classes. So here are all of the cran all of the cranberry market classes. And here's the key. The Matson bean cooking time is the dark blue. So the highest one, <clears throat> both of the black beans. Took the longest? They took the longest to cook. Yep. The shortest is over here. Is the other eclipse black bean? So there's just so much variety. And then this is the firmness after they cooked. So that there's so much variation in terms of soaking. Some beans were still hard. I had to really select. I only use plump beans though. But I noticed is the seed coats are all very different, and they soak at different rates, or absorb water at different rates. And then this is what I really can relate to is the pressure cooker firmness. So after 10 minutes, so here's, here's the force on one side. So that's actually, I should probably make these numbers a bit. This is future. I should probably make these numbers. I need to have two different graphs. That's what I need to do. So the higher the firmness number. The higher the firmness, the less cooked they are. Yeah. So the lower ones. So here we are. Mats and bean cooker cooking time on average was 19 minutes. And the mats and bean cooker firmness was 8.6. So, I'm sorry, this is actually kind of difficult for me to even tell you about right now. <laughs> so this is something that I'm, we're working through, obviously. And we're gonna do this again for the 2014 variety trials. And we're, what we, our goal for this is to make a correlation. Is there a correlation between the mats and bean cooker and the pressure cooker? so that we can do these quick mats and bean cooker tests and know how long it'll take in the pressure cooker. So thank you for bearing with me on that one. It's such a learning curve. Yes? Are you soaking your beans at all? Yeah, so I'm soaking them for 12 hours. Thank you, that's if I'm soaking them. Of course I'm soaking them for 12 hours before we do any of the cooking times. Okay? This one's a bit easier. This is just protein. So people wanna know how much protein are in your beans because they are an excellent source of protein. And plant-based protein at that is low fat, no, virtually no fat. So we don't have the capacity to measure protein at the 
Mount Vernon lab. So we sent them out to the soil test labs in Moses Lake. And this is a delicious calypso bean dish my father made, who's a chef. And he's, he's enjoying that I'm learning about beans, because oh, yeah. then he gets to make yummy recipes. So here's some results from the protein. Again, these are grouped by market class. But over here, I wanted to include these, even though they didn't have a matching. And really what we learn here is the difference between the protein is just really eating a few more beans. So I'll give someone in the crowd a prize. If you can tell me the recommended daily amount of protein in grams we need. 60. No, 71 is for a pregnant woman, so 60 is a little high. 40, it's, a, 40, 45. it's about 45, 46. Darn it. I told you, so I can't. You do get prizes today. We can share. Field chips. You guys want to just open these and eat them? Yeah. I'm going to just go off track for just a second, but uh, I'm, I'm being supported by Beanfield Chips Company. And I love it. They're delicious chips. They are a very small, healthy snack company. Just pass those around. They're the fastest growing healthy snack company in the United States. And they use beans and they have a mission for sustainability. It's really great. So these are the sea salts, and over there are the pico de gallo. And you can actually get full off these, because why? Tell me why. Fiber! Fiber. You get an extra chip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the beans are an excellent source of fiber. Yeah. They're located in Los Angeles, California, and they have um, their beans, chips grown sold at many of the health food stores, co-ops. I'm sure they'll be in Hagen's very soon. Beans. Okay. I heard they're the magical food. They're the magical veggies. Okay. The more you eat, the more you reduce your risk of heart disease Yay. and obesity. Okay. <laughs> So this is just the, the next step for me in this variety trial is to complete the data for the yield and taste of harvest for this 2014 variety trial. And here's the beautiful Kring's cranberry. Mrs. Kring is a woman on Lopez Island who's been growing her beans for many, many years. So she's contributed a few varieties to our variety trial. Is it considered heirloom? It's considered an heirloom, yeah. <coughs> Okay, so the next goal is the dry bean education. And I'm curious if anyone in the crowd is, has been involved with the edible education. Oh, cool. You too? So you might find this interesting. The goal here was to implement K-12 dry bean education. Our goals were to promote healthy eating behavior. We focused on nutrition, biology, and math in the school garden. And then we had to evaluate the impact of the education. So just in general, school gardens, they're growing. And this is, nationwide we have 31% of our school districts growing school gardens. That equates to 2,400 school gardens in the nation. And in Washington State, we have 26% of our school districts growing school gardens, which equates to 71 school gardens. And that is the most recent farm to school survey data from USDA. 49, here's a cool fact. 49% of Washington school districts are promoting locally purchased food. And we can give a shout out to Rachel, who works for farm to school, and just other, who else works for farm to school here? Anyone? Okay, so farm to school is doing some really great things to help do this. It's being done in cafeterias and classrooms to connect our students to where their food comes from and to give farmers a market. It makes so much sense to have a secure market for our farmers and have the students be the consumers. So we developed, yes, question? I'm sorry, for people who aren't from here, I don't know what farmer's school is. Oh, good. Do you want to tell them? Um, it's a national organization that then happens on a very local scale. And the, the three main goals are procurement of local products. As, Please, yeah. Procurement of local products for the school district from local farmers, um, school garden implementation, 
and curriculum in the classrooms cool. about healthy eating and connecting kids to the source of their food. Mm -hmm. So it's Thank a you. nationwide. Yeah. And I've been working closely with the Whatcom Farm to School with my project. So one reason why teachers can't take their students out in their gardens that are already popping up in their school districts is because they don't have curriculum to go along with it. Mm. So the goals for our curriculum were to incorporate interdisciplinary common core standards. We wanted to make this nationwide, so we included national, the new national next generation science standards. And we based this on STEM. So that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's a picture of me at Mount Erie Elementary School Garden in Anacortes with their beans growing so beautifully. So our objectives here were to create K through 12 school garden curriculum. We measure, we were to measure driving preference and knowledge before and after the education of the students. And our, re our real objective is to increase drive being served and consumed in school cafeteria meals. So we chose dry beans because it's an ideal crop to grow in Western Washington. And they are nutritious, inexpensive, and there are also a very interesting biological tool because they fix nitrogen and they have pods and seeds. They are interesting to the children. And we base these on K-12 education standards, like I said before. And there's students measuring plant height. Right there. Okay, so we, like I said, we base this on standards because teachers need that. It depends on what teacher you talk to, but most teachers say they need standards to take their students out to the garden. So we created three lessons for fourth grade, and we carried this out in six classrooms in Whatcom and Skagit County. And what I'm telling you is what I did in spring 2014. So here's the cover of the curriculum. And this is available online. Is that going to be on our handout there? No, but if you would like this entire presentation, we can email it to you. Okay? So you don't have to be busting your hand. And then when you get into the curriculum, this is one page in lesson one, predicting and observing seed germination. So they do planting in inside and outside, so they can do some um, varied environments. But the real fun part is going outside in the garden and planting the seeds. Here they are at Mount Erie Elementary. They're using math, math skills here. They're spacing two inches apart. They're using rulers, very practical math exercises. <coughs> Rather than using a textbook, they're in real life doing it. And I think that's one of the really cool parts about school garden education. Here's some students measuring dry bean height. So they're also, this girl on the right hand side, she's actually calculating emergence. So she's doing an average emergence of this dry bean variety. And then these boys on the left, they're calculating the average plant height of their variety. So they planted multiple varieties and they're essentially doing what I did in my variety trial. So it worked out really well that I have this experience in, <coughs> with the variety trials to go along with this project. And then, of course, they harvested. And this is two years of harvest. This is on the left, 2013, in the fall, and this is just last month. But I wanted you to see that they are also harvesting. They're measuring the length of their bean seeds. and having a great time. And then also, one important aspect which needs to be further worked on is getting the kids to eat the beans in the, school cap in the classroom with this curriculum rather than just in the cafeteria. So one way I was able to do that was to make a cooking demo. So I did. And we showed it in the classrooms. And it, there's something special about having just having students watch somebody cook. I mean, this is a good way to do it too because then they can show their parents at home 
and the recipes online. The internet's pretty darn nice for things like this because you can just access it if you have a computer at home and show your parents and then do it at home. That was the idea behind this. So it's a 12 minute cooking demo. Yep. I have a question. So on the, um, the curriculum that you also yep. showed the um, website for, yep. is a link to this on there? Yes. Great. It is. Awesome. It's in lesson three. Great. All right, so we implemented the curriculum and then we needed to measure, make some measurements. So we used a student survey. We had 119 students involved. For fourth grade, I had 101 students, and for fifth grade, I had 18. So it's interesting. Some teachers took their fifth graders with this fourth grade curriculum. Some teachers did even kindergarten. I didn't get measurements on those, but we've had a, a wide variety of teachers just be very creative with the curriculum and do what they will with it. But we focused on fourth and unallowed fifth grade passing. I had a control class, which was 18 people, so they didn't receive the education, but I also I gave them a pre and post to see if there was any differences there. So this pen, paper and pencil survey was very brief. It included eight questions, including preferences for dry beans and their knowledge on the nutrition and the biology. So it included Likert type scales, which is like a scale of one to five, multiple choice and true and false. And then we analyzed it using the Wilcox and Sign Rank Test. We measured the mean change pre and post education of matched survey responses. So here's some results from spring 2013. These are the student survey responses. Let's try to work through this. Where's my clicker? Oh. <clears throat> How are the chips? Good. 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 Yummy. So here on the, this axis has the Likert type scale. And here are the questions. So for instance, how would you feel if the school cafeteria was to serve more beans? Before the education, they were a little unsure. But then, after the education, it increased. They would prefer it more. So we were trying to make assumptions based on these preferences. Because I'm just going to go off on a slight detour, we try to actually measure the amount of food they ate in what's called a plate waste study. It was really difficult. So we were hoping that if we can just measure their preferences, which as you can see increased, that that will translate into them actually wanting to eat more. Because as students are introduced to foods in multiple different ways, just like us adults, we're more comfortable eating it or doing it or whatever that is. And this is, this is a funny one. I eat beans, dot, dot, dot. The Likert scale was never all the way up to daily. So it was never once a month. So the Likert scale, all of these questions had different Likert scales, but they essentially were from one to five. So I eat beans more after the education is what that means, which is good. And then their preference here, I would like to eat beans increased and do you think beans are a healthy food choice? Their knowledge on the nutrition increases as well, which also translates into, I will eat more if we have our human survival skills in check, I, I'd like to say. Okay, so yeah, 119, this is based on 119 students. And then, so those are preferences. Here's some more knowledge. Beans are an excellent source of dietary fiber. The percent of correct answers rapidly increased, or majorly increased. The question, are beans, this is a true or false question. Beans are in both the protein and the vegetable group, because they are in the USDA food group, they are considered a protein and a vegetable. Students increased their knowledge on that. And then here's a biology question, where do you find beans on the plant? And the answer was in a pod. And they increased their, correct answers post-education. And I should have said before, pre is the blue and post is the red. So in general, we had an increase in all of the categories. We 18% increase in student preference for being served in school cafeterias. 
8% increase in desire to consume more beans, 6% increase of reported bean consumption in general by students, 13% increase of referring to beans as a healthy food, 36% increase in knowledge of beans as an excellent source of fiber, 11% increase in knowledge of beans as a protein and a vegetable. So as students become more familiar with this food, the likely, more likely they are to consume it. And that is really what we are trying to do in this project. So the next steps for this project are to continue implementing the fall curriculum. We still need to harvest some plants in some schools, which I'm learning that incorporating new curriculum into schools is difficult. So finding the time to do this is hard. Even though they, they knew well in advance, it's just these are the things that we need to think about when we're doing farm to school education. So with the fall harvest, they're studying the biology of the mature bean plants, which includes the nodules on the roots where the nitrogen fixation happens. And then I'm, this curriculum is still in revision state, so we will be revising based on teacher feedbacks and observations. And then I will continue this step, which is assessing the availability and opportunities to serve these pulses in the school cafeterias. And this is through a needs assessment survey with the school food service directors in our region. And that's a germinating bean here. This is part of their seed germination experiment inside the classroom. It's pretty darn neat. And I passed out those bean chips. It's part of my master's research campaign. We had a, originally funded by the American Pulse Association, and I'm still seeking out funding for the second half of this year. So we made a, it's called crowdsourcing. It's another way the internet has revolutionized the world, is to use the internet to actually just read out, reach out to people and ask for funding. It's beans, Kids and farmers .com, supported by Beanfield, so all the funders get chips in return for funding. Pretty neat. I just wanted to show that to you guys. There's a video on there, and I update it like a blog, so that people can keep up on the research. And I wanted to make some acknowledgments. There's many collaborators. This list could be very long. So when you're working in school districts, you have many people involved. Principals, teachers, school food service directors, and the school garden educators. I want to thank Common Threads Farm. Then I want to thank my committee members, and my committee chair, Dr. Carol Miles, Drew Betts, Janice Rada, and J.D. Baser. And my supporting crew, Brooke Brower, Leanne Riddle of WSU Food Sense. Susan Kerr, Carolyn Klismith, and the graduate students, faculty, and staff, of course, at WSU Mount Vernon. It's been an amazing journey. And then my funders, the American Pulse Association, who originally came up with the idea of the school garden curriculum and wanted to do that, and NARF, Northwestern Agricultural Research Foundation, and, of course, Beanfields, Bean and Rice Chips. So with that, I'm going to go back to the pharmacy and pick up my prescription. <laughs> Healthy foods. Okay, thank you guys. We can do some questions. Thank you for your attention, everybody. What do we think? Are beans great or what? Beans. Yes. I have a question about the um, increase in people's gluten intolerance and autoimmune things. How do beans help with that? They help, I mean, they don't have any gluten. Okay. And the, glu the gluten tolerances are increasing, obviously. And that's one of the niche markets that the Beanfields chip company has, is that they're gluten free. And the, you can powder those up. So you can actually make flour with beans. And use it not as, just like um, bread, making bread, but that's something that the Bread Lab at WSU is going to be working on, is working with this high protein bean flour and no gluten bean flour. So it's, 
In the research food sciences realm, they are just realizing how wonderful beans are and that they can make flour with it. So it won't be long until we see more and more products with beans replacing things, which is good. Yes, sir. Well, I've been growing dry beans for many, many years, and people think I'm crazy for doing it because it's such, it's so labor intensive, you know, actually yep. at the end. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just glad to see you come through with research like this because I think more and more people should be doing it. Because there are other varieties that you don't see in the store, mm -hmm. which I think is very important. There are thousands and thousands of varieties. So you saw all those market classes, that laundry list of market classes. Within each market class, there's thousands of varieties. And beans, they don't actually, they don't cross very easily either. So you can keep a, a pure variety pretty easily. They have really closed in flowers and they self pollinate before they even open. So you can keep your bean rice semi pure. They do cross sometimes, like 1% crossing, but they're very nice. So Dr. Carol Miles also, she's been working with dry beans for over 20 years, the vegetable researcher. and. Her mission is beans. And we have a new graduate student coming on who's going to take over because I'll be done in May. So we're going to continue to research. And that brings up another point. Who can tell me what legume crop we used to grow in Western Washington that we don't grow anymore? I'll give you a hint. We used to have a processing facility for them, but they left town. So then that crop also left town. Green. And it's a legume. Green peas. Yes, fresh peas. Yeah. So this is, we, in 2010, all of the peas left town. It's a money thing, of course. But we need a legume crop in rotation because on a large scale. Yes, I'm talking large scale now. Yeah, on a large scale. So farmers want a legume back in their rotation. So that's driving this research, the variety cows. And we're seeing that they grow well. So it's a pretty exciting time. And we have Headland Farms just this year grow seven acres of beans and they got their they got good yield and so it's beginning. This is exciting. I like some of the yellow ones. They did grow any yellow ones, yeah. but yeah. they grew some really like standard varieties. Are you familiar with Indian woman beans? Yeah. yeah. Do you grow that? I grow that every year. Oh, cool. And where are you located? Whatcom? Yep. Cool. And uh, China yellow, it's very similar to Hutterite, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So. See, people have just, everyone has such unique varieties. Yeah. Cool. Yes? Um, Kelly, I was just wondering, is there a substantial nutritional difference between cooking dried beans and using canned beans? Well, she asked, is there a significant nutritional difference between canned and cooking from dry form? So one thing you want to be aware of is that there's lots of salt in the canned beans. So one way to get rid of that is just soak the bean, uh, rinse the beans. That's one thing you can do. Canned beans are really a time saver, I will admit. But one question I have, and I want to go to a processing facility and see. I wonder if can, canners actually soak their beans before they cook them. So that's a question I need to learn in order to fully answer that, because if they don't soak their beans, then you're definitely not getting nutrition that you could be getting. Really? Because seeds are dormant and they lock themselves that way and they need water to actually wake up again and release those nutrients into our digestive system. So if you don't soak your beans, you're not getting a lot of the nutrients. They have, there's actually anti-nutrient protection on the seed coat called phytic acids and Right. Yeah. Another one. Enzyme yeah, enzyme inhibitors. So you have to unlock that. Same thing with rice. Same with all grains. Seeds. All seeds. Rice. You need to soak all seeds because nature is very smart in that nature protects the seed from germinating. So. Unless it's been deshelled, it doesn't make any sense. Unless it's been deshelled. Yeah. Like it's like a sunflower seed, for example. Okay. That's, but like anything oh. that still has its husk or outside intact is where the phytic acids are going to be. Thank you. So if it has its husk or its seed coat on, you need to soak it. 
So to answer your question, I didn't really do it, but no, you do it. Okay. So you could call up Heinz and ask them, do you soak your beans? If not, we'll just start a I probably would start a processing facility in Santa Valley. Just because we need one. Yeah? Okay, I grew up eating a lot of beans, and I still do, and I was always told that beans were not a complete protein, and that you had to pair them with something else. Thank you, good point. So, beans are not a complete protein. They have a, another grain out there, though, that you can complement it with, any type of non-legume grain. So, wheat, rice. If you can bind those two, it's called complementary protein, and you'll get all of your essential amino acids. If you put butter, an egg, like a bean burrito with an egg for breakfast, or any type of meat protein, you can, there is research that says you can increase, so let me start off, you would get all of your essential amino acids if you pair beans with meat protein or animal protein, but you also increase the digestion of the proteins from the beans if you pair it with animal protein. Really? Interesting, huh? Yeah. So, yeah. Chili. And you don't have to eat them in the same meal even. If you eat them in the same day, you'd wow. be safe. Old knowledge said you had to be in the same meal. Uh -huh. Old knowledge said you had to be in the same meal. But that's since been said to be false. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes 12 hours for the digestive system to do its thing. Yes? Um, I would be interested in to know what your experience was in recruiting teachers to um, I would be interested to know what your experience was in recruiting teachers to yeah. incorporate your, I live fairly close to Mount Erie, among other things. Oh, do you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Awesome. But, um, and I know that they have a strong science teacher there, but I'm not familiar with, with any of the other teachers. Yes. So Jody Dillon of Mount Erie was really pivotal in this. So how did I get connected with teachers? I had a my foot in the door through Leanne Riddle, who is the WSU Food Sense educator. So how to educate people on a budget, how to eat healthy. So I had my I had her helping me. She knows principals in Whatcom County and and then I just email email connection and so that's how I connected with the Whatcom folks. And then in Anacortes, I, well, I was born and raised in Anacortes, so I went to my elementary school and asked. And it was amazing the response. Well, first of all, what I noticed is teachers were really willing to help. They wanted to be involved. Time was another issue. But, and then in Anacortes, it was so amazing to see the teachers just light up when they saw an, a, alumni come back, they had a part in who I am today. So of course they wanted to help. They were just overwhelmed with joy to help. So it was, it was, yeah, multiple reasons, but you have to have somebody who knows the principal, and then you have to have a, a you have to have a little shoe in a paper, and then really educate them on what you want to do, and communicate a lot. So it was a lot of work. So a lot of the farm to school education and I mean this education is aimed at elementary school kids. Mm -hmm. and it seems like there's still a need to do it more education in middle and high school, especially about as kids get older how they can really be involved in farming or gardening mm -hmm. or you know community service type activities. And I'm just wondering if you ran up to any barriers around that or if you've seen any inroads into those. Yeah, one barrier with that, she asked, why don't we go into middle school and high school? We did start off the curriculum with fourth and ninth grade. Then we realized that less high schools have school gardens, more elementary schools have school gardens. So that's one thing we need to do is increase high school engagement. And then the opportunities, the teachers were just as willing. It was just as, they were just as willing, but, and then, I had to focus on one grade because you got to keep a focus when you're doing something like this. So, and it's just, you know, I chose fourth grade because the teachers had more opportunities for me to do it. So that's why. But I still think that the high schoolers 
they were really into it. Wheelbarrowing, composting, they were hard workers, those ninth graders, and they enjoyed it. So we do need to educate the middle schoolers and high schools. Yep? Can you give me an idea of how, what quantity of beans of like one variety you would need to plant in a home garden to get a worthwhile amount? Yeah, so I would just simply, this is what I recommend. One 10 foot row. <laughs> and if you don't have row gardens, then just at least 60 seeds. Okay, and 60 so, seeds. so if you have a 10 foot row and you plant them two inches apart, that's 60 seeds. Right, okay, so, so 60, just so 60 seeds, so about how many pounds? You, oh, um, it's about, gosh, I used to know this. I think it might be in the publication. So I can get you that answer, but I don't know off the top of my head. What would you say? Well, I my rows are usually 25 or 30 feet long, mm -hmm. and I don't weigh what I get, but it's uh, I suppose about a gallon of beans, maybe dry beans for that 30 foot row. Kelly, your publication says yeah. 1.2 pounds. Thank you. I knew it was in there. So will you read what it says to her? What did it say? Is 1.2 pounds per what? 10 foot row? Yeah. Okay. 1.2 pounds per 10 foot row. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. And that's the yielding rate. Yep, that is the yield in pounds per acre. Based on pounds per acre. 1.2 pounds per... You can, you can multiply that out to get your average yield for an acre. If you're going there. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you for asking that. The number of seeds, that's good too. Yes, thank you for asking that. Yep. But I'd be curious, again, on the home on the home garden scale, when you're all done, you have your product, you store it in an airtight, like a mason jar type deal? Mm -hmm. Is that the best way? <clears throat> so she asked, how do you store it? I would actually, if you don't think that it's fully, fully dry, yeah, the best way to do it is in a paper bag, mm -hmm. if you're not certain that it's dry. Mm -hmm. You want it, if you're measuring, it's about 12% moisture. And then you can put it in a sealed jar, but if you're going to eat it within the year or two, I would say just put it in a plastic bag in a cold, dark area. Wait, plastic? Fine. I thought you said paper. I did say paper. Okay, did you mean paper? I mean paper. Okay. Thank you. Paper. So if you eat it within a year, you can just leave it in the paper? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Super easy. Well, I make sure mine are very dry. Now put them in a plastic bag and put them in the freezer for a while. To kill any eggs or oh, cool. larvae or anything that might be in them. And then I take them out and just leave them in the plastic bags, and I think they will last for actually years, probably. They will last for years. Yeah. They will. That's so cool. And that's a storable protein that you don't have to freeze or process. So beans are just really valuable. valuable. They're so valuable. And did you guys see all the different varieties in those vials I passed around? So those are all of them. And you can, you can also plant pole beans in your home garden, but we didn't do pole beans because you can't really tractor cultivate. And we are working for the agriculture arena. So I, you can get more beans per plant with pole beans though. Then another thing you can do, and I've done this, you can shell them before they get dry and uh, blanch them and keep them in the freezer. Oh, that sounds good. So he's using them like fresh beans. Yes. They're called, are they called shellies? They're called, yeah, shellies. Yes, shellies. You'll see farmers at the farmer's market in, during the summer, they'll prematurely harvest and sell them as shellies. So then how do you, you cook them when you're going to eat them, or do you just You eat cook them? them, but they don't need that much cooking. Because they're so... Oh. Uh, and they don't need to be soaked because they're already, they don't have that seed coat yet. Showy, like that. So that's just a different way to do it, yeah? When you did um, school gardens with this, how did you cultivate them over the summer? Oh, this was students. How did we cultivate the weeds over the, the plants over the summers? Parents and students volunteering throughout the summer. Yep. And that's a, one unique thing about this crop is you can plant in spring, and you don't have to harvest during the summer. When the kids are out of school, you can actually harvest when they get back in school. That's another reason why driving are a good crop for school gardens. Yeah. But 
But if they're not irrigated, I mean, they didn't irrigate them at the school either. The schools irrigated them. Oh, okay. They did. And that actually caused an issue because they just kept growing and growing and growing. And totally. they didn't stop growing at the time they should have. So they're pretty darn green. They were green when mine were dry. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, they over, not over nutrient, but they just, they lush up their gardens. It's, I mean, they're beautiful plants, but they, dry beans are pretty low maintenance, is what I'm saying. Did you have any trouble with disease or pests? I've been so lucky in that I really had hardly any disease pressure Good. In, West, in Mount Vernon. I had potential for disease this um, last season in my King of the Earlies, but I never got diagnosed and it didn't spread, so I actually think it was just them maturing. We were, we were curious, is this browning due to disease or maturing? Never found out, but you might wonder that when you're growing your beans, because when they turn yellow and discolored, that's actually what they should be doing. Some people think that it's gamish, but it's not. Yep. Are there some dry bean varieties that are good to eat as green beans too, like a double purpose? Yeah. You can you can eat any of your dry bean varieties in the green bean stage. However, they if you wait too long, that pod's too fibrous. So there's actually different, I don't know if it's a different species for green beans, do you? I think there are some dry bean varieties that you can eat when they're as green beans, but I never do because they get too straight. Yeah, so I think they've actually, they've selected dry beans to be green beans, and the ones that I'm working with were not. <laughs> they were just meant, let, let I've had luck though in growing the kids' gardens because they're just such a cool plant to grow. Scarlet runners. Oh yeah. If you get them, if you pick them as a green bean when they're super young, I mean super young, super young like yeah. really thin, then you miss out on the fibrous aspect. But it's such a, it's a fibrous aspect of it. Yep. But they're such a great plant for especially young kids because you can make kind of stuff for them to grow over and TVs and tunnels and whatnot, and then ultimately have the beans too, the, the dry beans. So it's like a little bit of everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it's very fun. I would recommend experimenting with doing that in your home gardens for sure. Yeah. I was wondering about the eating part of your experiment. Have you, how have you? The what part? Eating. 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 <laughs> I eat a lot of beans now, but that's <laughs> in the schools. <clears throat> so we incorporated eating them into the curriculum, but we haven't actually ate them in the classrooms. Okay. We did incorporate them into the cafeterias last fall, 2013, and measured the pre-education consumption and the post-education consumption, and it increased. But it was too difficult, so I we kind of just learned from that, and I didn't present it. So ideally, the next time a teacher takes that curriculum, they'll actually do the nutrition section and take the recipes that are really easy. In class, they can use these recipes really easy show the demo, and actually just get the kids eating them. Because the, there's multiple, there's nature, there's math, there's all these things, but then there's eating. And that part really didn't, if I was doing a PhD, I probably would have taken another year and done this. But unfortunately, that's something I've learned though, it needs to happen. How did the cafeteria prepare? The cafeteria, so the cafeteria was really wonderful and they took them in dry form which if we're gonna connect local farmers to cafeterias, they're gonna be in dry form, unless we have a processing facility, which we don't. So they soaked them and cooked them. I gave them a couple um, recipe options. They chose which one worked best, and they chose cheesy beans. So just pintos with cheese and apples and chili powder, like a casserole. So it was almost like macaroni and cheese with beans. And served them up and I measured and one cafeteria made bean dip as well, but the kids didn't know how to eat it. So that's interesting. The kids weren't taught how to eat this food. There's, kids are not familiar with beans very much. They are through Taco Bell, and that's the number one way. And of course, some home cookers. There are some kids who eat them at home, but that's not the majority. Okay, we have just a, two more minutes. Any burning questions that you haven't asked? Um, when you were doing your cooking demo, what were you cooking? 
I was cooking really unique stuff. <laughs> Two ones I made up. It was a black bean bars. So it was like black bean brownies. Okay, I made two desserts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and like, she's like, I don't want them to eat healthy. I'm like, butter's good for you. I have a different view on what nutrients are than the USDA would say, but you need butter, of course. So I made black bean bars and I made a midnight black bean cake. Ooh, wow. It's very good with coconut honey frosting. Oh. So the kids really like that. They're like, what? You can make a cake with beans? Yeah. And they weren't, it wasn't bean flour, it was just pureed beans mixed with flour, and it made a fluffy black bean cake. Wow. So, yeah. Did the cafeteria continue to make your recipes? They haven't. Okay. No. Was it like a time issue with soaking? It is a time issue. And that's what I'm doing, I'm assessing these barriers. And it's obviously, they don't have time. So we, we, would benefit from having a canning facility here if we want our local bar bean growers to actually get into the cafeterias. But it really doesn't even take that long. If you just put the water over it the night before, it really doesn't take that long, but it's a, it's a psychological thing, too. It's one extra step. It's one extra step. Mm -hmm. So we just need to, it's more about education to the school food service directors as well. So that's another aspect that needs to happen. Thank you, guys. That was fun. I will come around and collect your evaluations and uh, appreciate it. So we videotaped West's presentation, and I thought, did you mention whether or not um, you want to make your presentation? I, yes, I told them I would.